We are for the church and for the kingdom. This vision drives everything we do. There are many noble causes and institutions in this world, and we care about the future of seminaries, academies, governments, social causes, and parachurch ministries, but they are not fundamentally why we exist. We exist for the future of the church and the advancement of God's kingdom. With God's help, our students today will be the pastors, ministers, and missionaries of the global church tomorrow. We teach the Bible in the classroom so that generations of churches will be sturdy outposts of Christ's kingdom. This is how we serve the church, and this is how we bless every other good and noble endeavor until God's glory covers the earth like the waters cover the sea. Will you join us? Turn with me to Matthew 17. Matthew 17. Um, honored and thankful and uh, always properly frightened uh, to be preaching in chapel. Um, it's an honor from, from Dr. Allen. And uh, just as a word on Dr. Deucing, um, believe the hype about Dr. Deucing, okay? What I would say as far as uh, being with him overseas, um, it is all accurate what you've heard, and it is to scale. He, he really is someone you should uh, hang out with when you're eating your donut here in a little while. So um, pray with me if you would. Father, bless this theological meal um, we are ab about to um, partake of. Make it nourishing um, and bolstering to our soul. In Jesus' name, amen. What is uh, the most precious doctrine in all the world to you? What's the most precious doctrine in all the world? I didn't say uh, the most powerful or your favorite but the most precious one. And, and I think uh, what I want to get in your mind is the one that saves you, so to speak, when you're in despair. What's the most precious doctrine in all the world to you? Maybe it's justification. You're free in Christ, right? Is that the one? Uh, maybe it's inerrancy. This is the bedrock. You came to the Lord and you realize he has not given you shifting sand, but you can trust what you see in the scriptures. Maybe it's substitutionary atonement. Condemned he stood in my place, and I've never forgotten that. I've never gotten over that. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's the doctrine of God, God in himself. For me, it's adoption. It's the doctrine of adoption. And no doubt, um, as I survey my, my own soul, it's my own experience with a pretty fractured up family, um, but there's just something about the knowledge that I'm in the family of God that is stabilizing for me. Um, for me, uh, there's a link between the most precious doctrine and kind of the ache in my soul for family, like what that looks like, what it should lo look like. And for years, um, I'm not going to pit these two doctrines against each other, but I am going to contrast them so you can see what God's doing here. But for years, I went to um, justification uh, for what I think I'm supposed to go to the family of God metaphor in the whole New Testament, that idea. And I was going to justification for that. There's nothing wrong with justification, obviously, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But today, I'm burdened to raise the mystique um, of the doctrine of adoption. I want to raise that in your mind and sometimes, this is to the degree, okay, this is what happens, and you can only do an intro like this in a seminary, but like, I like daydream about weird stuff. It's like a Theo nerd. One of my daydreams is, what if there had been a sixth emphasis in the Reformation, like a sixth sola, and what if it had been adoption, right? This is, I mean, I'm a Theo nerd, like, I'll admit it, but it's like, these are things I think about, I'm like, sola adoptatio, like, <laughs> it sounds good. I, you, see, you see what I'm saying? I, y'all like it. Okay. Note to self, this is working. All right. So um, let me see if I can illustrate this for you. Justification and, and adoption. Again, in no way pitting these doctrines against themselves. Justification, it's forensic, right? It's a courtroom scene. Justification says something like this. Sam, look down at your wrists. You are free. There are no chains on you. Glorious doctrine, right? But adoption's something different. It's a dinner table scene. It's a living room scene. 
Adoption does something a little different. Adoption is at the end of that courtroom scene, me, I go out of that courtroom, I go bounding down the court steps, right? And the father, son, and spirit are at the bottom, right? And, and like a, a convertible. And we whoosh off together to Sonic. And the father buys me like the Titanic sl- size blue slush at a happy hour. But we're not done. We, from there, then we go off and we go to Disney World and we ride rides until we throw up, right? This is the doctrine of adoption. And, and all metaphors break down, <laughs> but some break down quicker and worse than others. Um, but you can see what I mean by the difference, right? They're both glorious doctrines. One is forensic, one is familial. Matthew, Paul, and John all deploy this family of God metaphor in, in different ways. And given the state, I don't, I don't have to explain this to you, but given the state of the family, you can see immediately how powerful this is. Given the state of fatherhood in our culture, given the state um, of just what it means to be a son or a daughter in a family, and the, the ruptures that, are, that we see all around us. I mean, you can see how important this is. So these images, these terms, this cluster, that kind of, I'm just calling the family of God metaphor, becomes hyper-relevant, really, really powerful. Here, here uh, the apostle Paul on, on the family of God. You are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. It's Paul. Here's John. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's John. Today, we're going to put Matthew and his family motif under the microscope. As you know, and Dr. Allen said yesterday, we're going to be looking at parables throughout the semester, and he had the first installment, and and I'm going to jump in today. This is my aim this morning. I want to um, pour steel into the spinal column of your soul on what it means that you're in the family of God, that this is who you are. This is your identity. You're a son and that that can't be changed. And God, God is, he's a father to you, a perfect and unfailing one. That's why I've come. That's my aim. So Matthew 17, chapter, uh, chapter 17, verse 24, and we're going to read to the end of the chapter. And I will tell you, I'm going to call this a micro parable. All right, there we have it. Wouldn't probably find its way onto most New Testament scholars' parable list, but it's on mine, and I'm kind of more of an Old Testament guy, so here we go. All right, verse 24. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the temple tax approached Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he said. When he went into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. What do you think, Simon? Simon? From whom do earthly kings collect tariffs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? From strangers, he said. Then the sons are free. Jesus told him, But so we won't offend them, go to the sea, cast in a fish hook, and take the first fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you'll find a coin. Take it and give it to them for me and you. Here's the main point. This micro parable uh, is about the nature of the kingdom of God. It's about the nature of the kingdom of God. Dr. Allen mentioned that yesterday. Most of Matthew's parables circle around this. And what is the nature of the kingdom of God? There's going to be an explanation of that in this brief teaching he has, this parable. In God's kingdom, this is it. This is the nature. In God's kingdom, every citizen is a prince. In God's kingdom, every citizen is a prince. You should have kind of a mind-blown moment. There are no normal citizens. There's none. Not in this kingdom. By status, by standing, there are only sons. 
princes. That's the point of this micro parable, at least for us. That's the text from below, if you will. The bigger issue is that Jesus, well, who's Jesus? He's the son of God. He's the prince of princes. He's, he's the king, right? Here's where we're going. We're gonna, our time will be governed by three different meditations, all concerning the, the nature of kingdom sonship. That's what we're going to be talking about. And then we'll uh, develop one primary kind of takeaway. First, we need to uh, address a few exegetical quandaries um, in the passage. We're just kind of swooping in. So I want to touch on a couple of those. First is just a brief word on Matthew's thematic context. And what I need you to hear this um, passage on uh, is, is kind of a backdrop. So Matthew centers most of his parables on the nature of the kingdom. And for our passage this morning, uh, it's worth highlighting that God, through Matthew, Luke gets a lot of um, airtime with this, but Matthew does as well. He focuses on this, but he has this particular um, penchant for emphasizing the kingdom priority of the forgotten person, the little man, if you will. So a lot of his exchanges and his parables often circle around um, figures like small children, sons, daughters, and then, quote, little ones, okay? Here's just a small sampling um, set up by questions, right? So, so who does God give good gifts to? When we look at Matthew, we look at Jesus, it's his children. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Who does God restore in this kingdom, in his kingdom? A woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up before him and touched the fringe of his garment, for she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. So who does God restore? His daughters who come weak, humble, real. What kind of person does God reveal himself to? I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. What about in this kingdom? Who's the greatest? You want to be the greatest? You got to be a Jesus kid. Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned. So the greatest are the little ones. And don't mess with God's kids. Who does Jesus bless? Who does Jesus bless? Children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. He prays for them. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. This is just a sampling. This is the thematic backdrop of, of how you have to hear what he's saying in chapter 17. A second uh, kind of quandary and just a word, I want to give you a word on daughters as sons um, in this text. Whether you are, and I'm talking biologically, whether you are a daughter of Eve biologically or you are a son of Adam biologically, you are who you are in large part by virtue of who your mama and your daddy is. And I know what I'm saying. I understand that you may not know your father biologically. Let me uh, show you this. In family worship, uh, it happened a minute ago, standing next to Dr. Dusing, um, most Sunday mornings, I am haunted by my father. I don't mean that in a bad way. You know why? When I sing, I think my dad's next to me. My voice sounds like my dad when I sing. We are uh, connected to our parents. This is something that our culture is raging against in trying to destroy the gender distinction, these sorts of things, raging against us. 
sweeping it under some cosmic rug somewhere. And, and it's not going to work. What's amazing about this is that God isn't embarrassed about the way that he made the two genders. He's not. He didn't, like, mess up there. He isn't embarrassed about the way he created the family with men as head of the home or sons distinct or daughters as distinct. He's not embarrassed about that. Remember Genesis 1. He made this thing good. He's not embarrassed. Our culture is raging against it, trying to sweep it under the rug, but you as a son or a daughter are who you are by virtue of who your people are. That's not your whole story, but it's a massive part of it. And the spiritual reality, you should draw a connection between this. There's an image of something greater going on. It's a bigger deal that you're in a spiritual family than even your uh, physical one. And it's not an accident. So daughters, let me talk to you for a second. Daughters of God, you are every bit as much in this text. You hear me? And you know where you are? Paul tells you, you are hidden in Christ. Chapter three, Colossians. You're hidden in Christ. You're right there. You're every bit as much there as the boys, right? It's not an accident. This doesn't, this text doesn't, and I'm not trying to distort gender um, nor roles. They're not distorted in the new heavens and new earth. What it's showing you is that God has always been uh, uh, throwing human beings off the assembly block, magnificently typical. As male and female, he doesn't destroy that, but he speaks to both through what I would call federal headship. And it's going to show up throughout the text, and, and it's important that you hear it in light of that. So this doctrine of sonship is something like this. This is what's happening, and then we'll move to the next quandary. Sons and daughters by gender both receive the rights and privileges standing as princes, all while remaining gloriously and distinctly sons or daughters biologically with distinct roles. It's an inheritance model. That's what's happening here. We're talking about inheritance primarily. Lastly, moving on, taxes. We've got to say something about taxes in this text. The subject is temple taxes, not Roman tax. It's really important for you to get that because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Jesus is landing a lesson for you and for me, not so much on for us, so we're talking about temple tax, on tithe or offering, but rather first on his identity as the eternal son, as the only begotten son. That's the text from above. Who is Jesus? He's the son of God. The text from below for me and you is on the status of the child of God. Who are you? You are a son. That's who you are. Here's the first meditation. If you're taking notes, here you go. Sons of God really are sons of God. Sons of God really are sons of God. Look at verse 24 and 25. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the temple tax approached Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? His answer, yes. When he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. What do you think, Simon? From whom do earthly kings collect tariffs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Peter's response, from strangers. And then Jesus, the most compelling phrase in here, then the sons are free. Have you ever thought about the fact that um, sons don't work to be sons? They just are sons. Have you ever thought about that daughters don't work to be daughters, they just are? It's a status, it's like granted. What is so beautiful and powerful about this passage is that those who are in Christ get that status. They're, they're, they're receiving, he's announcing all the rights and all the privileges of being God's heir. That's what's happening. You're swept up into the Son of God in this passage. So again, you've never met a mere citizen of God, uh, of, of God's kingdom. By status, there are only sons, only princes, only heirs. Why? Well, because when God is king, there isn't anything, not one molecule that doesn't belong to him. That's his kingdom. It's, it's all his. It's all his. So if you're his son, he doesn't need your tithe. He doesn't need your taxes. He doesn't need your offering. He'll use it, and he's going to use it. It's actually about you being a prince. 
and we'll talk about that. But you need to hear up front, he doesn't need your stuff. It's not what this is about. He doesn't need anything, right? He's self-contained, self-sustained, and has no need of anything you've got. He's supra-sufficient. I don't mean super, I'm saying above, supra-sufficient. He doesn't need your stuff. It's all his, every breath you have. So everyone in this kingdom of God holds the status of prince, and he invites you into your princely duties, and we'll see that in verse 27, but sonship is irrevocable. I I look at Owen. Owen's two years old. This is my youngest uh, son, kid. And I will tell him, you know, Owen, you can't do anything that would make you not my son. Most parents go with, I will love you forever. And I'll say that, but I want him to see something really distinct. He literally can't do anything that would make him not my son. It's irrevocable. And he typically looks up back up at me and says, I'm two, and I don't understand (laughs) deep things, you know. I was just training him, but I mean, this idea, he can't not be my son. And you have to get that that's that's real. That's this micro parable. I mean, that's what's happening here, um, is this relationship between the old and new covenant and how sonship takes uh, center stage in the middle of it. This passage should be framed, you know, further, just explaining it in the idea of Matthew 5, 17, right? Where he says, I I don't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And then you're throwing the sonship idea in here. So Jesus is foreshadowing the temple tax as fulfillment and its status as on the brink of being obsolete. And, And there's some shift that's happening Uh, Something about the old way that doesn't work. It doesn't grant sons, right? It's never meant to be that. So Jesus here is playing coy, of course, and you can feel that. I I don't know, Simon. What what do you think? Where do kings get their taxes from? Is it their kids? Of course not, right? So notice also um, the first miracle in this episode is not actually the temple paying uh, tilapia, right? In verse 27, check it out. It's really like a tilapia. Um, but rather, Matthew invites us as readers to read Jesus as divine. You'll miss that if you don't kind of stop him for a second. So when he went into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, verse 25. This is Matthew, you know, yoo <laughs> who is this guy? Like, I mean, he's inviting you to go, no one uh, just like knows conversations except God that he wasn't a part of, Right? So um, we're seeing that omni-knowingly, uh, omnipresently, Jesus anticipates Peter, and that's the first miracle um, in this passage. Uh, back to sonship. Um, let me see if I can illustrate this uh, idea of sonship and just how manifold this means that, that God would say something like this to you. On, on any given Sunday, You'll find me, if I'm not out preaching somewhere, but most of the time I'm going to be at Liberty Baptist Church, and I intentionally um, pick up one of my two oldest children, Abby or Levi, and I'm going to hold them really tight as I'm singing. I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to hold them really tight, clutch them. I'm going to be singing, and I want them close to me so they can hear me strain a little bit, that I'm singing to our God. They can hear the vibration on my chest. Abby's seven as of Monday, and I won't be able to hold her, you know, forever. I would like tear my shoulder out or something. But but while I can, I want her to know daddy believes everything that we are singing. I don't ever want her to look up one day and wonder if I was just a sham. But that she has memory after memory after memory of this is what it means to have this father. I don't have any father out there. I have this one. And this is what he did. What, I'm, what am I doing? I'm linking her to the most valuable thing that I have as a father, the things of God. But what if we're talking about God the Father? Well, he has everything. I mean, you see how it's scale. I mean, it just moves um, how much greater to have the Son of God at Almighty as your father. So sons of God really are sons. They really are uh, princes. To be from your family, I don't know about you, um, but to be from your family is going to be on a scale, right? You may have had a terrible father, uh, a terrific father, 
But what this passage does is I would discourage you from trying to minimize whatever your father was, but rather use him to kind of locate yourself on the atlas, if you will. Whatever his weaknesses and and lack was, he was the biggest piece of trash or your greatest treasure on earth. Locate yourself and then look to your real father, your ultimate father. Because between whether trash or treasure, between him and God the Father, there is an infinite distance. And that infinite distance is is built and and, uh, containing uh, holy, 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 goodness. And you look to him. The significance of this micro parable is that to have God as your father is to have everything. To have everything. I mean, the word is so small but it's to have everything. So you really are sons of God, and that really, really is something. I mean, it fixes stuff in your soul, and it changes your history. Sons of God really are sons. Meditation two, sons of God are free by virtue of our elder brother, Jesus. Sons of God are free by virtue of our elder brother, Jesus. Verse 26, he answers, Peter's answer is, of course, from strangers. That's where they get taxes from. Jesus's response should stun you then the sons are free. Then the sons are free. Or, indeed, then the sons are free. It's the most potent phrase in the exchange. Understand Jesus' move here, right? Jesus makes or intends that everyone who would ever read this text, that they would understand that he is the Son of God. That's the move he's making. He's saying, this is my father's world. I didn't get to Dr. Swain in time to tell him, like, that's what we need to sing. This this is my father's world. This is my father's temple. This is my father's money. This is his sea. This is his fish hook. This is his tax-paying tilapia. This is everything. It's all his. I don't pay taxes, but I will. I don't have to pay taxes. I mean, be shocked. Be amazed. This is who our God is. And then draw a line from if you're in Christ, well, then what does that mean about you? Sons are princes, and that's who you are. What do princes do in their father's kingdom? They move about in their father's realm freely, unfettered by the common regulations of the common citizenry. So this is a theological logic bomb he's dropping on your head. And that's what he's doing. If Jesus is the son and heir of all, and one this morning finds oneself under the covenant headship of Jesus, Romans 5, and no longer under Adam, then one finds oneself free. That's what it means to have Yahweh as your father. You are free only insofar as you participate in the one true free son of God. That's what's happening. He is the elder brother who went out and took down Satan, sin, death, and hell for you. He is our champion. He's our emancipator. He's our elder brother. It's Jesus. He's everything. He's what this building is about. He's telling you, if you're in him, he, you are free. At the cross, he paid the bill in full. He paid your taxes. He did away with the old system that was never designed to make you a son. It couldn't pull it off. So we should be drawn into worship. I mean, I I have like sometimes these moments where I'm like, man, just hit the Enoch button, God. And this is one of those moments. I just can't get my mind around it. Sons of God are free by virtue of our elder brother, Jesus. Indeed, the sons are free. Meditation three, sons must live free in this realm, but that doesn't mean what you think. Sons must live free in this realm, but that doesn't mean what you think. Verse 27, but so we won't offend them, go to the sea, cast in the fish hook, and take the first fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you'll find a coin. Take it and give it to them for me and you, right? So this is the moment in the, in the text and Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all kind of do this literarily, but it's like, this is the moment where it's like, but wait, there's more, right? So this is not the main part, but it's confirming stuff. 
So this micro parable has this micro miracle in it, the first one, the second one, but it's confirming and proving that Jesus is the prince of, of heaven and earth. That's what, he, he controls all. He's the darling of the spiritual realm. He is who he purports to be, and he confirms it, right? He's the only begotten son. He's very God of very God. Note well that this miracle isn't the prime point of the parable. That's not what's going on, or this passage, if you will. But rather, Matthew invites you to register this miracle is confirmation of the trustability of Jesus, that he really does own every created thing ever and control it. Jesus proves with this second piece of kind of razzle-dazzle in the passage that, that he really is who we're tempted to think he is. And how does he do it? He does it by paying his taxes with the tilapia. That's how he does it. Um, so he's showing that the old customs of the old covenant uh, are, are inadequate, and he's also exploding our categories, all of our mental breakers at the same time. So I tend to think, this is just a little bit of expository conjecture, okay? I tend to think that Peter probably didn't even use bait. Nothing in the text about the bait. It's like Jesus, like, throw a hook in. Peter's like, watch this, boys. I just throws it in there, comes back, ink, coin, right? This is God. That's what we're supposed to see here. It's kind of a flex, but I think that's what's happening. So um, are you tempted to think Matthew's angle, his theological angle, his literary angle, is to show that Jesus here in this little parable is meant to make your tithe and your offering seem small, insignificant. I, I think you'd be right to think that. Kind of like Sunday morning and your offering isn't really about God so much as that it's about you and changing you. Like you're free to do something different with your money, maybe. It's not like God is um, rummaging around in his cosmic pockets trying to find something to pull off the Great Commission, right? It's like, I can't, I can't figure it out. I hope you give 10% Sunday. We're toast if you don't. Like he doesn't need anything. Like that's the, that's the point. What, I mean, we know from Psalms, right? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills and like all the molecules in a million galaxies. Like he doesn't need your money. He does use it, and he tells you to give it, but that's where the freedom comes in, right? What about this? Have you located yourself in the story yet? I hope you have. You're like the last word, right? You're Peter. Take it and give it to them for me and you. It's federal headship, Romans 5. You're, you're subject to all the rights and privileges and presumably everything else I mean, you, you have it all. You're a son. So if he's your champion, then you have everything. If he's fighting for you, then he gets you there. You can put it on the tab, in other words. It reads, created it all ex nihilo, right? I mean, he, he's got everything. And so he doesn't need your money, but he invites you to it, but it's on your freedom. So here's your takeaway. Sons are slayers of self. Sons are slayers of self. That's what freedom means. Let me see if I can excavate that freedom for you a little bit. Here's what your freedom looks like. Just give you some examples. You're free to read 10 or 20 chapters of your Bible today. You can. What else are you going to do? Waste your time on sin? You're free. Why not just do it to taunt Satan? The whole kingdom of darkness, you're free. It means a little bit different than maybe what you thought. What about your money? You're free to offer up 20, 30, 40% of what you make to the Great Commission at your local church. Flip that. You're free. That's what this means. Your heavenly Father owns everything. He clothes the lilies of the field. He can care for you. You're free. You're free to serve others. What do we know about this kingdom? It's an upside down kingdom. The winners are the losers. The weak are the strong. It's a race to the bottom. And who, what's at the bottom? The servants, the glad hearted ones. They give their life away. They, they just slay self by giving it away. They're living sacrifices. 
That's what freedom is about. But what does Jesus say? That's where you're going to find your life. You don't have any life if you're holding on to your money. You don't have any life if you don't ever read your Bible. You're going to find life when you give yourself away, when you serve your roommate and like do the dishes for the third time when they were supposed to do it the first time, but you like hit it three times. That's where you find freedom. You're free to confess your sin to your roommate or your covenant church member. Your heavenly father already knows the mess you are. He knows. He bought you as is. He knew. You're free. You're free to confess your sin. Here's a wild one. You're free to study theology here, ethics, Hebrew. That's crazy. If you're in this room, and you are, you hit the church history lottery. You, you see that. That's why I can't like get over my job. Like I'm just like, I can't even believe I'm doing this. I get to like deliver the lottery to people. People don't get what you get, sons, prince. In church history, they don't. It's just by virtue of this is your good father who gave this to you. This is crazy stuff you have access to. You're free. You're free to go hard at your studies because God just, he loves you. If God has freed you, who can enslave you? Sons really are free in this realm, but that means something different. Uh, it means that we're going we're gonna to slay self and find life in the middle of that. I want to conclude. Remember what your uh, most precious doctrine is? What, what was that most precious doctrine for you? For me, as I said, I hope I've raised to some degree, I hope the text has, uh, the doctrine of, of adoption, the doctrine of sonship for you. And, and for me, it was just the remedy and continues to be. It was so absent from my gospel. It wasn't absent from the gospel, but from my gospel, so absent for so many years and how I understood um, what it looked like for me to slink up to God when, when I have sinned. I'm not coming as a stranger, not coming as a common citizen. I'm coming in as a son. He knows me. When uh, Levi was seven months old, um, we were driving home from a longer story than you want to hear, but we went down to Texas. That's where my folks are. Um, and we went down there in the van, but we were coming back with another car, the one that I currently drive. So we had Abby and Levi, Levi seven months old at the time. And, um, we had to drive two different cars. Uh, Levi, you should know something about him at the time, was this dude was happy-go-lucky anywhere pretty much in the universe except a car seat, okay? So if me and mom are on it at the same time, then someone's there to kind of manage like he's not having it, right? Um, but there's two cars, so you see the problem. Like we're dividing our forces. Someone's gonna have to take on Levi. Federal headship, right? So I'm like, I got this, babe. I so um, uh, this is like a 10-hour trip from Texas, but since we're a little family, it was about 47 hours. And um, so we're coming back, and here's the further iteration of the story. He particularly went ballistic when it was night. Like, I mean, it was like uh, car seat, night car seat is like ballistic time. So I'm like, we're coming up on seven in Kansas City in here. You know, so we're, we're moving, uh, and... On cue, he just starts coming unglued, right? Um, an hour, literally an hour and 15 minutes of like snotting and snarling and like raging, like in this, in this seat. I'm like calling Mallory every 15 minutes. I was like, yeah, I can do it. It's going to be okay. Um, uh, my, I mean, my glass is like, my eye is like glass. I just remember being like, it's just going to crack. Like I'm going to, um, he's crying. I'm crying. I was crying like at various <laughs> points. I'm dead. I'm dead serious. Um, and so what is Levi trying to communicate to his father at that point, right? It's, Dad, get me out of this seat. Just get me out of here, right? No matter what, like, just get me out. Stop the car. Uh, get me out of here. And, and, I mean, what do we know about being God's son, like, in, in this realm? It's difficult. We are not in the new heavens and the new earth. There's a lot of suffering, a lot of sin that you endure, a lot of sin you expend, a lot of pain, a lot of heartbrokenness, 
a lot of difficulty, right? But what, what is Levi trying to communicate? Get me out of here. And what am I, as his father and all my fatherly wisdom communicating to him, in, in, as finite as he is, right? Incapable as he is. Hey, you don't know what's good for you. You have no idea what I'm doing. I'm trying to get you to your mom. I'm trying to get you to the warmth of our home. I'm trying to get you back to your sister. I can't stop this car. But guess what? You have my name. You're in the family. This is what it looks like in this time to, to, to work through this difficulty. But you got to trust my heart on this. I'm taking you home. We're going home. Let me pray for you. Father, you are good, and you do good, and we trust you. We want to trust you. Whatever distance there is between what we do trust and, and how we can grow, make it so this morning. It is amazing that we are free. Let us not take that for granted. Cause us to, to be uh, Romans 12 kingdom citizens, that we are living sacrifices. Not that we have to do mental gymnastics all the time to do it, but change our hearts. Make us into glad-hearted servants. Transform the way we think about our money because we're sons. Shock of all shocks. We are, we are princes in your kingdom. We're not normal citizens. Because of what your son has done, we have access to all. So help us. Help us understand what it means to be spiritual sons of yours, to be adopted into your family. Put steel in uh, these folks' spinal column of their soul. Help them understand who they really are and change them and their self-identity. In Jesus' name, amen.